So good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, depending on where you're attending from. And welcome to Reach's uh, February installment. In fact, it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day uh, of coffee and conversations. And we've got a couple of amazing panelists with us today, which I'm looking forward to uh, have you hear from and ask questions of. Let's give it a couple more minutes to allow participants to join. All right, great. Can everybody see my screen or maybe Alan or Monica, you can give me a thumbs up. Fantastic. All right, let's get started. Um, we're gathered here today to talk about the science and genetics of Hirschsprung disease. Um, my name is Eric Schnadig. I'm your moderator today. I'm also the proud father of Adrian, a 16, almost 17 year old boy with total colonic Hirschsprung disease. Alan can't believe it. Uh, I can't either. Um, and I'm a co-founder of Reach. Uh, and I'm really, really pleased to host this group today. Um, let me give you a bit of background on Reach. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization based in the US and Canada. And our entire focus is on research, education, and awareness for children and their families dealing with Hirschsprung disease. Um, we are based in Boston, Massachusetts, and proudly out of Winnipeg, Canada. Um, and we work really on three primary goals. We want to be the go-to resource for families like us uh, managing children with Hirschsprung. Uh, we also want to be a bridge between the medical community and our families. And then, of course, we want to raise money uh, wherever possible to promote uh, research and innovation in the field to eventually find a cure uh, for the disease. Um, some of the resources that are available um, are really readily accessible on our website at reachhd.org. Um, we have everything from how-to videos on bowel irrigations. We have case studies and stories from parents and families. Um, and then, of course, we're running things like this, the Coffee and Conversations, which we find give families a more regular opportunity to interact with experts in the field uh, and uh, families like themselves asking questions to help them uh, through through this journey together. Um, most recently, we published a book um, on uh, dealing with Hirschsprung disease, really from the parental perspective. Um, and this is available on Amazon. And it's a nice way of introducing um, family members we found, as well as other people, friends, teachers sometimes uh, to the disease. Um, I promote it here because it was beautifully illustrated by my wife, Isabel, and co-founder of REACH. Please check it out. Let me touch for a moment on some research initiatives. Um, we've been awarding grants uh, since 2013. In fact, this year will be our 10th uh, grant. Um, and this, as I mentioned earlier, is really designed to promote new innovation uh, in the field uh, around Hirschsprung disease. We've had, we've been lucky to have so many winners from around the world and um, very excited every year to announce and evaluate the grants that come in. Um, this last year, we had our first uh, in-person annual symposium jointly hosted by Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Um, we are going to be experimenting this year with a virtual symposium. Uh, we've had a lot of success with these coffee and conversations, and so stay tuned for that. Um, we're continuing to, to work on new technology innovations at REACH, including a mobile app and patient database. Uh, we'll be hearing more about that in the months and years to come. And then new this year, 
is the REACH Fellowship, where REACH is going to be sponsoring a uh, early in their career pediatric surgeon or gastroenterologist to travel to uh, a, a center of expertise and excellence around Hirschsprung disease. And um, we're rolling this out. This will be something new this year. And we're looking forward to, uh, again, getting new minds and, and new, new uh, innovation into the field uh, to help advance this uh, search for the cure for HD. So find us on social media, find us on the web, uh, and uh, we're here to support you and your families. Great. So now let me turn to the main event. We've got a couple of amazing panelists today, Dr. Alan Goldstein and Monica Razzo, a geneticist, here with us to talk about the science of HD and genetics. Um, I'm not going to attempt uh, to uh, introduce these folks. They have very impressive bios, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Alan will start it off, then we'll follow with Monica, and please use the Q&A feature in, um, in Zoom to log your questions, and um, I think we'll see how it goes. We'll, we, we may, you know, ask questions along the way, or perhaps pool those till the end. Great. With that, Alan, Monica, thanks so much again for joining us. Let me hand it over to you, Alan. Thanks, Eric. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody who's here. Uh, Eric, if you, I would like to share, let's see. You may think, do so. All right. How's that going? Good. So um, what I wanted to do this morning was to tell you a little bit about what happens in the world of research in Hirschsprungs. I am a, um, a pediatric surgeon. I'm the chief of pediatric surgery at Mass General Hospital in, in Boston. I've been studying Hirschsprung disease in the lab for 20 years and um, taking care of lots of kids with Hirschsprung disease as well. And um, uh, really uh, pleased to be here as part of this uh, REACH uh, coffee and conversation, and please ask questions. If you like science, you're in for a treat. If you don't like science, we'll make it uh, interesting. Um, so the intestine has this very challenging task of moving food and waste from the mouth all the way to the bottom. And it does this with a process called gut motility. Gut motility uh, requires the coordinated activity of uh, nerve cells and uh, muscle cells. And the two of those work together, and you can see here what roughly a, a schematic of these incredibly complicated nerve connections that interact with the muscles to create that movement that we call motility or even peristalsis, which is that coordinated squeezing of, of food and waste along the intestine. The intestine is amazing because it'll do that with no input from the brain or spinal cord. And um, let me see if I can... Uh, I was hoping to show a video, but let me let me just you know, let me see if this video works real quick. I think you can still see the uh, the screen there. If you put something in the intestine on a dish taken out of the body, the intestine knows just what to do. It'll move it in the correct direction using that. Um, peristalsis or gut motility. And the um, way it does that uh, involves the enteric nervous system, which is called the second brain. The, um, there's a few terms to know, and then the rest will be much easier to understand. A neuron is a nerve cell. When we talk about a neuron in the intestine, we, it's a ganglion cell. All those things mean the same thing. A nerve cell is a ganglion cell, is a neuron. And enteric refers to the intestine. So an enteric neuron is a ganglion cell in the intestine. The word ganglion cell is good to know because it explains aganglionosis, which is what Hirschsprung disease is, the absence of ganglion cells in part of the intestine. So Hirschsprung disease is that absence of ganglion cells. And so 
if you look at a normal intestine, you'll see these clusters of nerve cells, these dots along the entire, in this case, I'm just showing the, the large intestine, the colon, where this is the beginning of the colon and then goes this way all the way down to the rectum and then the anus. In Hirschsprung disease, you can see that those clusters are not present, usually just in the lower part of the colon. Um, as it says on the bottom here, 80% of kids with Hirschsprung disease are just missing nerve cells in the rectum and sigmoid colon, which is the part just above the rectum. But sometimes it can involve much more of the colon. It can involve the whole colon, and it can even involve the whole colon plus parts of the small intestine. It happens roughly one in every 5,000 uh, babies, and we estimate that there are 800 children born with Hirschsprung disease every year in the US. So how do we treat Hirschsprung disease? Treat it the same way we've treated it. This is the, base, I think, 75th anniversary of the first description of the operation for Hirschsprung disease by um, Orvar Swenson. So if you imagine here, the large intestine coming down to the rectum and then the anus, there are little dots, pretend that those are the enteric nervous system or those enteric ganglion cells. And they're present here, but then they're not present at the bottom. Hirschsprung disease is simply saying, all right, take out that part that has no nerve cells and bring the rest of it down and sew it down to the bottom. Sometimes if more of the intestines affected or something else is going on, or it's the surgeon's preference, um, a stoma will be done first. And I'm sure a lot of people have experience with these uh, stomas. And then later this operation will get done. Um, some of you may have heard of the Suave procedure. That's a very common operation. It's very similar to the Swenson procedure. But in those cases, this pink part is the part with no nerve cells. And so that's removed. And the green part, which has what we're going to call for now normal nerve cells, is brought down to the bottom. And then another, other surgeons like to use the Duhamel operation, and we can talk about the differences if there's um, interest or questions later. Now, as many people know, despite perfect operations, there can be um, some challenges along the way. And we categorize these mostly as, number one, constipation. We refer to it as obstructive symptoms. For whatever reason, the colon, even after surgery, still has trouble evacuating stool. Second, there can be fecal incontinence. A kid might have accidents um, uh, after the pull-through operation. Enterocolitis. Enterocolitis is very important to know about when you have Hirschsprungs because that is the major complication of the disease. And it's, cause, it, it's a form of inflammation that happens in the intestine. It can happen before pull-through surgery or after pull-through surgery. And the reasons are really not known. Um, but uh, it is something to be aware of, and it is for sure a bump along the road. Uh, some kids require redo operations. It's estimated that up to maybe 10 to 20 percent of kids will need a redo operation of some type. And all of these things has a significant impact on quality of life for kids and for their families. The major areas of research right now, I would categorize in three categories. One is uh, first, why does Hirschsprung disease happen in the first place? Um, second, why do some struggle even after a perfectly good pull-through operation? And three, is there a better way to treat Hirschsprung disease? Is the operation we've been doing for 75 years, this idea of removing the aganglionic intestine, the only choice? So first, with respect to why does Hirschsprung disease happen, this is something I study, I've been studying for a very long time. And one of the models that is used is the chicken embryo. Uh, this is, if you take a fertilized chicken, you take off the shell, you can look inside. This is after about two days of fertilization, you can see a little embryo in there, lots of blood vessels feeding that embryo from the yolk around it. And um, we've learned a tremendous amount from the chick because it turns out that the development of the enteric nervous system in the chicken is very, very similar to the human. And basically what happens is this is an embryo, and this is where the science gets painful if you don't like science. The, um, the nerve cells come in from the top of the neural tube, the future spinal cord. Those cells enter the esophagus and travel all the way down the intestine to the very bottom. But sometimes they just don't make it all the way to the bottom. And the reason that happens 
is that in order for these cells to migrate all the way, they're called neural crest cells. They take these very long journeys during development. They have to get all the way to the intestine, and then they have to get all the way down the intestine. And that requires a lot of interactions between the cells and the environment they're in, which sends them signals, molecules, all sorts of uh, activity going on in that interaction to control the, the proliferation of the cells. You have to make millions and millions of cells to populate the entire intestine with an enteric nervous system. They have to differentiate. They, they have to become the right type of cell. They have to organize properly. They have to connect with muscle. A lot needs to happen. Hirschsprung disease always happens at the bottom of the intestine. You, you can't have Hirschsprung disease without having the rectum affected, for example. It could extend higher, but it always affects the bottom. And the simplest way to think about that is the fact that these cells start at the top and they travel all the way to the bottom. And sometimes maybe they migrate too slow, they don't divide enough, they just don't finish that journey. In, um, in this video, this is the last video, and that'll allow me to just one last time uh, show you. This is basically what's happening. Those cells are traveling down in the right direction. They're actively dividing right at the front, what we call the wave front. And behind, they're settling down and becoming nerve cells. So that process is what forms the intestinal uh, nervous system. And um, I think Monica's talk is going to be very important because the genetics of Hirschsprung disease is all about abnormalities in the genes that control this process of how the cells make it to the broad bottom. And I'm sure we'll hear about RET. Uh, the RET gene, which codes for the RET protein, is critically important in this process. So why do some kids struggle even after a perfectly good pull-through operation? Here's an operation I just did last week. Um, the, the baby's up here. I spare you seeing the child. You can just see the colon that's being removed. This is this narrow. So the anus would be down here. It's already been removed from the body, um, the colon. So this narrow part has no ganglion cells. That's typical for Hirschsprung disease. The part with no ganglion cells is very narrow. Somewhere up here is normal colon. But in between is this complicated thing we call the transition zone. So between no nerve cells and somewhere we're going to say normal nerve cells, there's a transition. It's not black or white. It is still not clear to us which part of the colon is normal. What, and the, this is something that no pathologist, nobody for now really has an understanding of. We know that this this just above the aganglionic part that has no nerve cells, there's definitely a part that's not normal. We usually say that's a few centimeters. Most surgeons will take out five centimeters of colon that has nerve cells just to try to get rid of that transition zone. But the truth is the part that stays behind, in this case, this colon up here is going to stay in the body. It may not be normal. There may not be enough ganglion cells. They may not function normally. There might be types of neurons that are missing. We just found in mice with Hirschsprung disease that the entire intestine is missing a certain type of nerve cell, um, that the entire small intestine, in fact. This was a surprising finding, but it may explain why um, kids don't do, sometimes don't do great after their pull through surgery. There's also different types of nerve cells. Some nerve cells are what we call excitatory. They cause the intestine to squeeze, and other ones are inhibitory. They cause the intestine to relax. It's that squeezing and relaxing that causes that peristaltic wave. If you have too many of one type, then the intestine won't work well. We found also that in a model of Hirschsprung disease in mice, there's too many of the relaxing um, nerve cells, not enough of the squeezing ones. So all of these are reasons that we're trying to, lots of researchers are trying to understand what is the, why is it that some kids um, are having this challenge? I'll say that in general, it's only been over the last probably 10 to 15 years that there's been a focus on studying what, what happens long-term. I think for a long time, pediatric surgeons were satisfied that we had a, a good operation. We removed the aganglionic intestine and that was it. But there's been a growing appreciation over the last 10 to 15 years that things don't go so smoothly for, for some kids. 
And um, in addition to doing that kind of clinical research saying, well, what percent don't do well? Can we predict who's gonna do well or not? Now we're getting into the more nitty gritty science to say, well, why is it that they're not doing well? And we're definitely making progress, but so far, um, nothing that we can act on right away. Although I think these findings of abnormal nerve cells, wrong types of nerve cells are leading us in the, in the right direction to find ways to fix this. And finally, I'll spend a little more time on this, which is, is there a better way to treat Hirschsprung's? Part of the problem with the way we treat it now is we just remove large intestine and we remove the rectum. And we, you know, sometimes a good operation, but there could be things that are injured. I mean, the nerves that the, the innervation to the sphincters, to the bladder, it's invisible. You can't see that, in, especially in a baby where spaces are tight. And so there may be injuries that are happening that nobody's aware of, nobody can even avoid. Is there a way to even avoid surgery? And that's what um, our group and several other groups around the world are working on, is this concept of cell therapy. If there's no nerve cells in the, um, in the Hirschsprung intestine, in this part right here, well, can we give it nerve cells and replace the ones that are missing? And the idea is, here's a part of the intestine that has nerve cells. Take out a little piece, grow up the nerve cells, and inject them into the part that doesn't have nerve cells. We could eliminate the need for surgery, avoid the risk of surgery in general, and, um, and really maybe change the way we treat the disease simply by addressing the actual problem, which is that there's nerve cells missing. So the concept would be if a baby's born with Hirschsprung, and um, this is a common scenario, kids a couple of days old, very distended, not passing stool. Well, maybe we take some stem cells from the intestine, or we can get it from other, other sources as well, um, expand them in a dish, and then transplant them. And here the green ones would be the ones that we've injected back into that Hirschsprung colon. We can do this in, in mice, um, and so if we look at a mouse, in this mouse, it's, uh, it's nice that we can label the entire enteric nervous system fluorescent red, so it's easy to see. We can then take those red um, enteric neurons or ganglion cells. They're in a particular layer of the intestine, so we just take that layer. We have ways of isolating the cells, growing them up, and then culturing them. They form these beautiful fluorescent red uh, spheres that we call neurospheres, and then inject them. This is a, a, this is a mouse with Hirschsprung disease. It's about a week old, and it's, um, here's its tail. We can expose the bottom of the colon, the rectum, and inject the cells there. And when we do that, you can see the red cells are, are um, spreading in the wall of the intestine. Green are some other nerve cells that are present. Um, and then the red are the cells that we transplant in there. And without giving much, you know, too much detail here, if we apply an electrical stimulus to a normal intestine, we get this contraction, this black spike here. In Hirschsprungs, that doesn't happen. These spikes are not being, these are just random spikes that happen in Hirschsprung disease. Honestly, a very interesting issue, but they're not electrically activated. And in the transplanted ones, the electrical stimulation now leads to a return of that contract contractility. And you can show that here with the, the blue bar shows that that electrically activated muscle contraction is back after cell transplantation. One very interesting thing we saw is that actually with cell transplantation, we significantly improve enterocolitis. These mice that we use all get an inflammation because of the bar here reflects the amount of inflammation. And the cell transplants reduce the inflammation. That was un unexpected, but shows what we knew already, which is that the nerve cells in the intestine control the intestine's ability to mount an, in, an inflammatory response. When you have no nerve cells, that's why you get enterocolitis. And it turns out probably by, uh, by improving the enterocolitis, mice that get cells transplanted in this green line live longer. Instead of dying at 10 days or, or two weeks of life, those mice can live three to four weeks, um, which is a very exciting observation. Completely premature to say that this could be done or would happen in humans, but exciting information um, as an early experiment. 
So over the last uh, many years, there's been a lot of advances in Hirschsprung's research. We uh, are much better at understanding the genetics and developmental causes, and Monica will tell us much more about the genetics. We're much more aware and have put more attention on the long-term issues that kids face, and some people are focusing now on, well, what's causing that and how do we fix it? And I think there is promise for cell therapy as a new approach to, um, to treat Hirschsprung disease. And maybe after 75 years, it's time to find a newer and, and better way to do it. But for now, surgery is what we have. So um, I'll stop sharing. And Eric, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Wow, that was that was fascinating, Alan. What a what a uh, simple and fast uh, fly through of seventy five years of science in HD. Fantastic work. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we've got a, a a pretty good group on the line. Um, I would encourage folks to raise their hand if they'd like, or I guess I can't see you that way at the webinar, but to use the Q and A feature. Uh, to post questions, um, and then we'll we'll turn it over to Monica uh, in a moment. Um, I I had one uh, Alan on, on the question of cell migration. Um, it sounds like that's the the key one of the keys to explaining uh, why kids uh, you know develop or don't have uh, the right um, infrastructure, you know, they don't have the neurons in the right places. Is that a volume issue? Is it a speed and direction issue? Or do we not know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the migration of the cells and their ability to get from the top of the intestine all the way to the bottom is driven by multiple factors. One is you definitely need enough cells. Um, and interestingly, there's this uh, sort of population pressure phenomenon. So as the cells divide, they get really crowded and they move forward. And the rate that they move forward is partly controlled by that density. So if you don't make enough cells, it's possible that you'll just run out before you get to the bottom and the bottom will have Hirschsprung disease. The other problem is that if you don't have enough cells, you may run out not because they're moving too slow, but because, well, not because there's not enough of them, but because they're moving too slowly. If the cell, timing is everything. So if the cell moves too slowly, the intestine ahead of it continues to mature and develop and gets to a point where it says, I'm no longer able or interested in accepting you. And when that environment is no longer interested, the cell just can't enter. So it's both the, the rate of division of the cell, um, which drives the speed and the um, migration itself. Um, the other problem we see in Hirschsprung disease is that these cells are like, they're like stem cells. They, they're not, they haven't decided what they're gonna become yet. Are they gonna become a neuron or a different kind of cell or they be, which kind of neuron? If they decide too early and they say, oh, I'm a neuron, they can no longer divide or migrate. That's a, what we call a terminal de decision. And so that early differentiation is also a problem. So it's a complicated process and there's multiple factors that could explain why they never make it to the bottom. But they do make it to the bottom most of the time. It's amazing, frankly, to me that Hirschsprung's only happens one in 5,000 times that it goes right so often is shocking. Right, so researchers like you, Alan, maybe they're, they're working on uh, you know, a neuron taxi to uh, get to the final destination. But that's fascinating how many factors are involved here, uh, and also a little bit daunting uh, as you think about the science. Yeah. Great, thanks for that. Um, do we have uh, other questions from, from the audience at this point? If not, um, and please, if you think of questions later, again, post them. Oh, great, we got, uh, got a question. Okay, this is from Shelly Leslie. Thanks, Shelly. I'm going to read it. If a baby has what appears to be a physiologically successful pull through, starts pooping on his own, but then stops, could that be a misfire between the muscle and the cells? Oh, another great question and a hard one to answer. The intestine may initially work, sounds like, but then stop working. Um, there, there's an algorithm we use. Uh, there's five things that we consider in that situation. 
Um, it, you know, there can be mechanical problems because when you sew the intestine, the colon down to the anus, that can scar. So initially there's no scar, everything moves down and then it gets scarred down, we call stricture. And now the kid can't go anymore. Or there can be problems with the, um, the, the squeezing of the rectum relative to the relaxation of the sphincter. The anal sphincter is not entirely normal in Hirschsprung's. It doesn't know how to relax. And while that might not be an, a problem initially after surgery, because the sphincter has been stretched to do the operation, later as it returns to its normal uh, function, it, it's too, it, it just doesn't relax when it needs to let stool through. So there's a lot of factors to consider. And, and a, um, I, I, if there's interest, you can send an email to Reach and I can provide a, a reference that will go through all of these different um, aspects um, that need to be considered. Uh, the cell not communicating with the neuron, that's a great question. We have never seen that. There's no evidence that that's the case. It's an interesting idea. I, I think more likely it's one of the more established uh, causes. Um, but thanks for that question. And please reach out if you want to get this sort of more uh, detailed answer on what, to, what can be done in those situations. Great. I'll make sure to post the reach uh, you know, email address for you, Shelley, in the, in the chat in a moment. Thanks for the question. Other questions for Alan? If not, let's, uh, let's go right to Monica. Um, Monica, thanks so much for joining us. Um, it'd be great to have you give a, a brief introduction of yourself and then take it away. Thanks so much. Um, hi, uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Uh, my name is Monica Razo. I'm a genetic counselor. I'm originally from Colombia where I studied biology and I master in biology and then I moved to New York and um, I got my master's degree in genetic counseling at Sinai and I work uh, for a little bit in clinical practice in prenatal and pediatric and a little bit of cancer. And I joined uh, Chakravarti Lab um, in 2019. So my boss, who also know Dr. Colstein, uh, he has been working in Hirschbrunn for more than 30 years. And so he has also been part of this group that discovered some of the genes that are involved with, uh, with RET um, and with Hirschbrunn disease. And, and I'm in charge of coordinating the Hirschbrunn study. So I'm the one that, um, when families find us in the internet, they contact um, our lab and then they talk to me to involve the study. So uh, I'm coordinated that part and the bio, bio repository of the samples. Okay, and I'm going to start um, sharing. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Where, where, did, it, where did it go? Um, can you see it now? No. Okay. I'm sorry. Can you see it now? Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to minimize this window. Okay. Um, uh, this is not moving, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to speak um, about mainly of the genetics uh, part of Houston disease and genetic testing. I'm going to skip uh, the overview because Dr. Paulstein already did that her job uh, doing it. Uh, and I'm going to give some definitions that um, of the genetic terms that I will use. Um, so, um, as Dr. Goldstein mentioned, most of the patients have short segment, uh, but it is also, Hirschbrunn is more frequent in males than females. Um, we don't know exactly why, uh, but there is a proportion of three to one overall, but in total colonic cases, the proportion of genders is similar. Um, so in terms of uh, definitions that I'm going to use. I like to use the analogy of the genetic information with a book. So in all of our cells, we have our genetic code and DNA. And the DNA has the instructions that tells our body how to develop, work, and function. So 
the DNA is organized in structures that we call chromosomes. And we are going to keep the analogy, chromosomes are going to be like chapters on this book. And a gene is going to be a sentence with a specific instruction, let's say like the color of our eyes, um, the type of blood that we have. Um, so when we have the information in a gene, um, our genetic code is composed for four letters, T, A, C, and G. And so in, if we have a gene, sometimes there is a change in one of those letters. And that change can alter the message of the gene. Uh, sometimes they've, we call those changes variants. Sometimes the, the change is too small and doesn't have a big impact. But sometimes we have extra or missing information on those genes and that can impact the function of that particular gene. When a pathogenic, when we found a gene that is associated, um, sorry, a variant that is associated with a disease, we call that a pathogenic variant or a mutation of that particular gene. Um, so talking about the genetics part, is Hirschsprung disease heritable or genetic? And the answer is yes, and we have lots of evidence. As Dr. Colstein mentioned, you know, the process that um, had to happen for the nerves to travel from the head all the way to the intestine and the rectum is a very complex process and is regulated by many genes. Um, so this support the genetics uh, part. Also, Hirschsprung, in most of the cases, is the only health concern that a patient has. But um, there is about 30% of the patients that have also other health concerns. And those are, this could be part of a syndrome. Uh, I'm going to show a little more about this in the next slides. And also, uh, Hirschsprung has a well-defined recurrence risk. That means the chance of another relative of also being affected with Hirschsprung disease. This is a busy table, but this is showing the chance of a relative, in this case, the siblings of children, depending on which region of the colon was affected. So for instance, if you have a child and uh, this child is a male and you are going to have another child if it's a boy, the chance of having Hirschsprung is about nine to twelve percent. If it's a female, is seven to nine percent. Uh, similarly, if uh, when this um, boy is going to have children, uh, the chance of having a boy affected is slightly higher than a female. How the specific genes causing Hirschsprung? have identified. Uh, so far, we know more than 34 genes that have been reported. The most common ones um, seem mutated are RED and EDNRB. But in about 70% of the patients, we can find variants in those um, genes associated with Hirschsprung, also in enhancers, which are genes that help modify other genes. And this is just an illustration of the RED and EDNRB gene uh, regulatory network, uh, which is showing here RED and EDNRB and other genes that also interact with each other. Um, the arrows in RED are showing uh, genes where we found uh, mutations in patients. As you see, this is a very complex relationship that um, we see between all these genes. In this graphic, uh, we are showing the relationship between um, some genes, the frequency and the effect that they have in Hirschsprung. So here uh, we are showing some variants are more frequent and we can see in about 5% of the population, some variants are very rare and could be in less than 0.1% in population. In the left side, we see the effect. Some variants can have very small effect and other ones a large one. So, oh, sorry. So for instance, in the cases of isolated or short segment, usually those are linked with common variants that have very small effect. 
Um, in comparison, when we see syndromic cases, total or familial, uh, those are linked to very rare variants with a large effect. Um, also here, we can see that mutations on the red gene, that is the more common one in Hirschsprung, there are some variants that have very small effect and very common, and some can be also very rare. And in the middle, we see um, also mutations on other genes that are part of this network are involved and associated with um, Hirschsprung with a moderate effect. How Hirschsprung is inherited. Um, so in most of the cases, there is no family history. In about 70%, of the, uh, the cases there is no one else in the family and we call that a sporadic. In, in about 30% there is family history, there is another relative that already have the condition. Um, so in familiar cases it's easier to see where the disease is coming from. If an affected parent uh, passed the gene of the mutation then the child can be affected. In the sporadic cases sometimes um, you know, the parents are healthy, but sometimes there could be a mutation that happened just in the egg or the sperm. And since those are the one passing the information to the child, then the, the child can have a mutation in the gene and the parents don't have that mutation, parents are healthy. It could also happen that this mutation happened very early in development. So Again, it's not inherited, it's just happening in one of the cells at the very beginning of the embryonic development, and then it continues in all the cells. Um, Hirschsprung is also considered a complex disorder. Also, we call those multifactorial, meaning there are many genes involved, and environment also may play a role in the effect of the disease. Um, here, I'm just showing a couple of examples of family trees of Hirschsprung families. Uh, the squares are male, the circles are females. When we have uh, clear um, uh, rounds or um, circles or squares are healthy, uh, when the images are filled, that means they have Hirschsprung disease. So as you can see in this family, this person or this, um, it was skipped. She has a father, a sibling, and children. So she has the mutation, but she didn't express. She was not affected with Hirschsprung disease. That's called in genetic low penetrance. That means a person can have the mutation, but they may or may not develop the condition. In Hirschsprung, we also see variable expressivity and means that even in the same family, we can see with the same mutation, some individuals with short segment and others with long segment. Um, in most of the cases also, Hirschsprung is the only health concern that patient has. But in about 30%, there are other health concerns as well. And those are coming mainly from three um, causes. One, it could be chromosomal abnormalities. And in our analogy, that would be like, if a person has a missing or extra chapters in their DNA book. The most common association is with Down syndrome. And kids with Down syndrome have a higher, um, in higher um, chance of having Hirschsprung, which is about a hundred times. We don't know, we don't understand completely why this is the case because down syndrome is on chromosome 21 and the red gene is in chromosome 10, but they may be some genes that are um, playing a role because in Down syndrome, kids have an extra chromosome. So maybe the number of genes can be an impact in other genes that are part of the um, genes that control the development or the migration of the neurons all the way to the rectum. There are other syndromes that we call monogenic, and that means only one gene is, is responsible for many symptoms. The third one is complex mutation. So there are some um, examples of um, syndromes where there are 
many genes. Some of them are, are very well defined and some we're still studying. Um, and I'm going to show an example in the next slides. So, um, sorry. So this is a busy slide, but I just wanna show some of the syndromes where um, the patients, besides all the, some of the features of the syndromes have, they also have Hirschsprung disease as part of the presentation. An example of this is called Waterburg syndrome, where a um, patient with this syndrome have changes in the pigment of the hair, the eyes, and there is also presenting uh, with the deafness. Some of the forms of this particular syndrome um, are associated uh, with this particular gene, and almost 100% of the patients with this syndrome have Hirschsprung disease as well. Uh, another example is called Mowat Wilson syndrome. And in this case, about 40% of the patients, with, but ranging between 40 to 70% with Hirschsprung, but they also have um, a small head, short stature, intellectual disability. Um, another example here is congenital central hyperventilation syndrome. And this particular uh, syndrome has many regions in the genome and many um, genes involved. And about 20% of these patients have Hirschsprung as well. Is genetic testing uh, for Hirschsprung available? Um, and uh, the information that I have here, I look in the genetic testing database last week, and we have 150 clinical genetic testing in US and six in Canada. Um, the difference between clinical testing and research testing is that in the clinical um, test, we are looking for well-known genes and pathogenic variants on those genes that are already proved to be associated with the condition. The test uh, could be different. Um, we have different options. Sometimes there is only, uh, let's say, tests for only one particular gene for red, you can have um, panels that have multiple genes, or we can even look at the whole genome. The results of these tests usually come back in a few weeks. Um, in research testing, uh, sorry, let's go. In research testing, uh, we are the only site uh, in the database, and we have mainly two cohorts of patients. One is uh, the cohort that we call HSCR, which is Dr. Um, Chakravarti's um, cohort of patients that he has been collecting for 30 years, and HDRC, which is a multi-site study where we have more than 23 centers in US and Canada um, that are collaborating um, in this project. In research testing, we look at, uh, we're trying to find rare variants in the known genes, but we are also looking for new candidate genes and modifier genes. That means genes that can affect the expression of another genes, like in the network that we were that I was showing before. In research testing, typically we don't return results on a regular basis because we don't know yet what we are going to find. Uh, but uh, if we found pathogenic variants that are relevant for patients' um, health and follow-up, we could uh, confirm those findings through clinical testing. How can I get a genetic test? Um, so genetic tests are ordered by a health provider, a doctor, or a genetic counselor, or geneticist. Uh, so it's important that you discuss with your health provider if there's genetic test is right for you and your family. You can, uh, you're going to review the pros and cons, the type of results that we can get. Um, typically the labs will return the results to the health provider that ordered the test, and then the provider will discuss the results with you. It's important to keep in mind the cause of the test and the insurance coverage. What will the genetic test results tell you? I'm going to use as an example, a test for the red gene. So if a person gets tested, we can get three possible results. 
positive, negative, of variance of unknown significance. When a test comes back positive, that means that we found a variant in a specific, in this case, in the red gene. We found a variant that is known to be pathogenic and associated with this condition. And this explains why the person has uh, Hirschsprung disease. Um, when a test is coming back positive, um, we can test other family members for the same variant to see if they carried or not the same variant. If we found a result, positive result, that means also if this person is going to have children, they may pass or not this gene. Uh, so the, the chance of passing it is 50-50 when you have a variant. Uh, but we have to remember that Hirschsprung is a complex disorder. And even if you have the gene, that doesn't mean 100% that you will have Hirschsprung. Also, we cannot predict at least at this moment, if we detect a variant, let's say, um, what type of Hirschsprung they may or may not have. Um, the positive results are usually um, in about half of the familiar cases and about a third of sporadic cases. When the result is negative, that means we didn't find a change of a variant in this particular gene. So at this moment, we don't have additional information regarding the gene. If we are looking at a specific gene that doesn't rule out that there may be another gene that can have a mutation or maybe not gene at all. In the cases of the negative result, we are not doing testing for additional family members. When the result is a variant of unknown significant, as the name said, we don't, we don't understand yet what are the implications of these type of variants. And sometimes that happens because that mutation or that, sorry, that variant hasn't been seen before. So we don't have enough information to predict what is going to happen to the protein and if it's going to be a positive or negative uh, result. Um, sometimes the labs, when they are getting more people tested, they could find these variants more times and then they can reclassify it as positive or negative. Most of the time, VUSs are not being negative, but if in a family we see the same variant of unknown significant in multiple affected people, that can lead us to think that this could potentially be the cause of Hirschman in that family. What are the benefits of genetic testing? Um, so genetic testing doesn't going to change at this moment, right? The management of Hirschsprung. The kids are going to have the surgery and managed by the doctors, but it could be, the results could be useful for some families and, and for some families going to be more useful than others. It can be important in the clinical aspect because we can get a confirmation of the diagnosis and this may be really important in syndromic cases to understand what may be other um, symptoms are going to be associated beside Hirschsprung. RET, which is the main gene for Hirschsprung, is also associated with some type of thyroid cancer. So if a variant uh, on red is detected that is associated with this type of cancer, it's important to have a screen um, option as a prevention method. Uh, the results of testing can be also helpful in family planning. As we know, um, as I showed before, there is a recurrent risk, but you know, the, having the mutation can be helpful in family planning. We have to remember the limitations, again, of this type of condition, even if we detect um, a positive uh, variant, that doesn't mean that the person will have um, Hirschsprung disease 100%. And I'm, I'm talking about the family planning. Um, this could also be helpful for management. Um, here, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the research studies. As um, I mentioned before, we're looking at 
known genes, trying to identify new genes. And our goal is to increase the knowledge about Hirschsprung disease because this could help to improve the estimated risk of recurrence in family members. Also, we are interested in seeing if there is a genotype phenotype correlation. That means if we know, if we can see that a specific mutation or variants are associated with different type of Hirschsprung, let's say one mutation is more likely to be associated with total or with short. And this could be really helpful um, for management. We are currently uh, having two projects that are supported by the NIH, the National Institute of Health. One of them, uh, we are actually in this moment organizing samples to send a cohort of our samples for whole genome sequencing. And the idea is that we could, again, look at known genes, possible identify new genes and variants and see that there's a correlation between what we see in the expression of the disease and some of the genetic changes. We have also another project that is focusing in the relationship between Hirschsprung and Down syndrome. So we are trying to understand the difference uh, between patients that only have Hirschsprung or patients that have Hirschsprung and Down syndrome and see if there are specific changes or mutation in particular genes that can help us to understand why this increase of recurrence is happening in Down syndrome. Um, so we are currently uh, recurring patients for our study. And for our study, we ask the, the participants to complete a questionnaire, uh, provide consent, of course. And if they have medical records, they can share it with us or they can give us um, a medical release. And patients can also submit blood or saliva samples for the study. Um, what other evaluation uh, shall we uh, uh, with Hirschsprung can um, need? Um, so in the case of personal or family history of endocrine tumors, it is important to be evaluated and genetic testing may be helpful, especially if a mutation is found, then the screening options are available to prevent those type of cancers. Um, in the cases of the um, syndromic Hirschsprung, there is it's important to have appropriate referrals, especially for genital urinary anomalies, uh, he hearing and visual impairment, and can cardiology, especially for um, Down syndrome patients. Uh, and this is not associated with Hirschsprung, but with Down. About half of the patients with Down syndrome usually present with cardiac um, issues. Um, because urinary tract anomalies are presented in non-syndromic and syndromic cases, um, it is recommended to have ultrasound screening for the urinary system, but practice varies. In summary, um, Hirschsprung is a complex disorder with a strong genetic component. Most of the cases are isolated, but we can also observe in familial. Um, Hirschsprung patients may have additional health issues besides uh, the colonic ones. The disease expression can be variable even in the same family. A person with a mutation may or may not present with the condition. Genetic testing is available and results may be more useful for some families than others. And intensive research studies are ongoing. So with that, um, thank you again for inviting me. And I just wanna share this information. Rare Disease Day is, on, is going to be celebrated on February 28th. Thank you. Just let me know if you have any questions. Great, thank you, Monica. That was fantastic. Um, we do have one question in the Q and A, uh, uh, you know, zone for Zoom. Uh, Monica, can you open that, or would you like me to read it to you if Let you can? See. Sorry, I don't see. I only see a, an email address. Got it. Well, okay. let me read. Let me read it to you then. Uh, mm -hmm. It's from Jordan. And she asks or states, my son, husband, and father-in-law all have HD, 
but genetic test was negative for ECE1, EDN3, EDNRB, GDNF, NRTN, and RET. Struggling to understand what that means and what next step should be should be to better understand the disease inheritance in our family. Okay, um, so thanks. Uh, it's an interesting question. So, uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes the the genetic testing can be only one gene or multiple genes. In this case, it sounds like she had a panel that have multiple genes involved, red and other ones. Um, so again, we are looking here at some of the genes that are known to be associated. There are more than 34 genes that we know at this moment have association with the disease. We don't know the full picture in genetics yet. So what may be happening, it could be that it is other gene or other mutation that in another part of the genome that is not included in that particular testing. And that's, um, so the next option could be go for a bigger panel or what we call exome or genome studies when they are looking at all the genes. Although this increase the chances of having another mutation, we cannot guarantee 100% that we are going to find one mutation or cause. Um, there are also in red um, some what we call are modifiers, and those usually are not part of the clinical testing because we still don't understand the full picture. So a modifier is another sequence that may not be necessarily within the gene, but they impact the amount of protein that is going to be produced. So we call the, again, those modifier. In clinical testing, we are not looking at those ones. You don't get the results on those ones. Um, so I could see like potential options, like either you go for a bigger test. This may increase, again, the chance of having another gene, but it's not going to guarantee there's going to be a 100% of an answer. Um, the other option is also participate in a research study. Because if we found other uh, supporting evidence for what we call candidate genes, candidate genes are not going to be in clinic, clinical testing at this moment. But if we have found enough evidence, those genes are going to be possibly part of clinical testing in the future. I Thanks, know. Monica. Um, it sounds like the, there are so many genes involved uh, in, in Hirschsprung disease. And then you have this added complexity of these modifiers that it's hard to be predictive with any kind of accuracy um, in, in terms of predicting you know, inheritance. Um, that, at least that's what I'm concluding from what you said. Yes, uh, that's, I mean, I wish we could have easier answers, but Hirschsprung is actually a model of this complex disorder. So there may be other genes that have a small effect or like it could be that variance in different genes is what is um, playing a role in a person to develop. Uh, there is um, a model that um, we have in genetics that is like if we have a jar and if we are putting, you know, little balls of like ping pong balls, we we can, if we need certain amount of variance in some people to really reach the threshold where the disease is being presented. And so in conditions like, like this one, I wish we will have a clear answer, but we know some of the genes are important playing a role, but we still have a lot more to discover and to understand for the condition. That's, that's helpful. And I, I suppose that is, indicates why it's so important to continue with these studies. In fact, Mary asks uh, in the Q&A whether Canadians can participate in the research study that you're recruiting for. 
yes. And uh, if any of the families are present here, uh, they can email me and we can start a conversation. We can send kids through, you know, we have participants from all over Canada, Australia, UK, and most of our participants are forced in US, but we have families from all over the world. And Monica, could you flash up on the screen again the, uh, I think there was a, a URL address for the study and getting involved and maybe your email address in case participants want to write that down. Alternatively, you could cut and paste them into the Q&A. Yeah, I, I, can, I can include it. Oh, let's see. Great. Okay, well, I know that Alan has to jump in one minute or so. Alan, did you have any uh, comments or questions on Monica's presentation? Um, any final remarks you want to make or any quest final comments or, or, or questions for Alan? I just thank Monica. It, it, the, the genetics of Hirschsprung is really complicated. And most, uh, again, speaking as a pediatric surgeon, we don't really know, you know, when to get genetic testing on a patient necessarily, what to do with the information. It's very helpful to hear your your presentation. And, um, you know, families should reach out to genetic counselors when, if they're, if they're you know, trying to decide um, whether to get tested and what to do with the information. You're a great resource. So thanks. Thank you. Great. Sorry to cut you off, Monica. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to thank Alan. Um, we can continue for a few more minutes, Monica, if you're available. Yeah, I'm available. Okay, fantastic. Thanks um, very much. I'm keeping the Q&A uh, open here. Is there any additional questions? I have one, Monica, for you. Yeah. Um, you you put on the, uh, your slides were really helpful you had one table indicating the chances of recurrence. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was wondering if that included the syndromic cases uh, or if, if that um, was excluding the syndromic cases or if the range included sort of a little above. I, 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 thanks, thanks for asking, but I, I, it seems to me you know, the, the recurrent risk is mostly for the non-syndromic one. And the reason that is in the syndromic, depending also on which type of syndrome, some of those syndromes are inherited in a different way than Hirschsprung. So for some of those syndromes, we have what we call autosomal dominant. And for some of those syndromes, if you have a gene, uh, so let me go back. For the autosomal one, that means having one copy of the gene is enough for having the condition. When there are other conditions that are recessive, that means you need a copy coming from that and the other from um, mom, and you need both copies in order to have the syndrome. So the, in the syndromic cases, because there are many genes and different type of inheritance, the risk is going to be calculated in a different way. Great, thanks for that. Okay. And so it also depends like if it's monogenic or if it's syndromic with a chromosomal problem, um, it is not, it's not the same. But the, the table is mainly uh, the non-syndromic isolated cases. Okay, thanks again. And if you want or somebody is interested, I, we can also go back to the table. No, I think that's, that's okay. I think it's a, it was a general question. Uh, and I think that's that's now clear. Okay. Um, all right. Well, um, I want to thank you, Monica, again, for your presentation. I want to thank all the attendees. I'll finish with a little plug for, um, for, for uh, reach with our, you know, Got to flash the SHIT happens, proudly wear it. And um, thanks to all the attendees for this 
Coffee and Conversations brought to you by Reach. I hope thank everyone you. has a great day. Thank Bye you now. for the invitation again, and thank you for, um, for listening to us today. Outstanding. Bye for now. <laughs>